Hello, welcome to Promenade Culture Center. This is Culture Corner. We bring you the authentic stories of creative individuals. Very delighted to have here with us today Mishari Al Najjar, an architect and an artist and a dear friend of Promenade Culture Center. Mishari, so great to have you here today. Thank you for having me. Yes. Thank you for coming and um, dedicating some time to our podcast. Yes. Um, we were just discussing prior to taping how we've already had an architect on board. Yes. Uh, but your path is a bit different. And I was hoping we could start by discussing how does one become an architect, especially when this kind of occupation is not something you will stumble upon in childhood yeah. or learn at school. Yeah. Well, ironically, I did stumble upon it in childhood. Well, that's a great story then. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, I don't know how it just came about. Um, well, I'm the third boy from my family. And then I have this, my sister who's younger. So I was technically the youngest boy. Uh, so my older brother had a Sega CD gaming mm. console and we were not allowed to touch it. So we would just sit and watch him play. So he had this, and this was back in the 90s, like yeah. it's a while ago, but he had this game where you play as a firefighter and you go and like rescue people in a fire and whatever it may be. And because I can't play, I would just sit and read the manual. And in the manual, they had floor plans mm. because you go into houses, you go into hospitals, things like that. And I was very young, but like something about the floor plans just like really attracted me to them. And somehow I understood them. Mm. as a eight, nine-year-old, which is, I don't know, kind of yeah, far-fetched yeah. now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but for, since then, I learned that there is something, I didn't know what it was called, but like you can draw a map of mm. a house. And from that, I used to draw a lot, sketch a lot. I invented an entire country. Oh. Of course, being very inventive, I called it the United States of Mishari. <laughs> <laughs> but... I did like draw a map. I made like these different projects, hotels, whatever it may be. And I used mm. to just go and sit with my aunts uh, and explain to them, oh, this is the hotel and this is mm. I don't know what. And yeah, and then I had a plan. I wanted to apply to architecture. It just came so organically. So the love persevered. Yeah, well, mm. uh, yeah, until a certain point where it just became the reality. And ah, yes. Now, let's say it's a love-hate mm. <laughs> relationship, but yeah, stuck, yeah. And um, the that path, when you decide you want to apply for architecture, yeah. um, how does that go within, within schools here? You didn't study in Kuwait. No. But you were practicing in Kuwait. Yes. Mm. Um, back, well, when I got into university was 2005, four. There was an architecture school and the plan was to apply here. Um, and at the same time, like I wasn't like I didn't really do a lot of research, which is maybe bad to say, especially for like fresh graduates. I didn't really look into it. The whole plan was, again, as I mentioned, I had two older brothers. They already applied to university. They went here. So I assumed that, that would be the same thing to me. Yeah. And then again, by chance, my mom came and she was like, by the way, there's a fair exhibit happening about universities. So why don't we just go and check it out? Mm. And I already applied to university in Kuwait and did the entrance exams and all of that. Okay. So we just went and we just walk around and then I, we see the American University of Sharjah, which mm. is where I ended up going. And my mom was like, oh, I think your second cousin, I don't know, twice related, removed, <laughs> I don't know what it is, like went to this university. Why don't we just go and see so I went and uh, the AOS or American University of Sharjah salesperson was very good. Mm. They convinced me on the spot. And we live in Mishraf, so it's very close. So my mom went, got all of my papers, information, and I did the application there. On the spot. On the spot and just applied. Yeah, got it. Thank you. How was that experience? You left home? Yes. I was very young. I was 17. Mm -hmm. Um it was very shocking, and I didn't realize how tough architecture school would be. Mm. Like, I thought it would be like, oh, I know, I just Like United plans. States of Misha. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, I got this, you know. Like, yeah. And uh, I went to public school in Kuwait, mm. so my English wasn't very good, even though I thought I was amazing in English. But my English was, like, taught from sitcoms and, mm. you know, video games or whatever, maybe. I didn't know how to write an essay. You know, and I went into an American university not knowing how to write an essay. Um, but yeah, it was tough from the beginning. But 
uh, I don't know, it's different. Like you, you're in this different universe, completely detached from everything. You're away yeah. from home. It has its perks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I grew up fast. And I think it really helped, even though yeah, yeah, at the end of the day, I was in the UAE. It wasn't so much of a culture shock. Hmm. Uh, but still, being away from home, seeing people, different nationalities, it was very much, especially AOS, they had a, a good mix of people. Like uh, So it was a bit of a culture shock, but I think it's happened for the best because I cannot imagine I would end up doing what I'm doing now had I stayed here. Yeah. Yeah. That experience brought you something. Yeah. Um, by that time, how much did you know about architecture in Kuwait? How much did you learn about it or knew about it? Did you research anything? Because um, I'm referring to this because we um, have a pleasure of working with you. And you do a lot of research prior to mm. talking to the participants or workshops you hold um, here at the center or other workshops that I've seen. Yeah. Um, that you organized. And um, one can tell that you know a lot obviously, over the years, and yeah. knowledge has um, grown. But back at that time when you were a student, were you interested in Kuwait's architecture? Um, not really. The history uh, of it. N- not really, because it wasn't taught. It's mm. not something you learn in school. Like, okay, architecture is Kuwait Towers. You know, yeah. at the wall, the Kuwait Sur. Mm. And that's pretty much it. Like, there isn't... Uh, any sort of education happening about building, like in the Middle East even, like even in university, we were studying about American architects Mm. and buildings in Europe and Gothic architecture and Renaissance Mm. paintings and all of that. Very detached. Yeah, completely Mm. detached. And to uh, like I graduated thinking that was architecture. Mm. So when I came back to Kuwait, I had to re-educate myself. And I just happened, I lucked out during... Coming back, there was a lot of discourse happening about modern architecture mm-hmm. in Kuwait. So a lot of books came out. A lot of people gave, were giving lectures. So I just went along, educated myself, and I spent like five or so years just online buying whatever books I can find. And everything was written in the 60s, 70s, you know. Yeah. So just acquiring as much knowledge as I could because it wasn't being given out or handed out. Would you be able to share with us um, what was the most interesting period for you? Is there something called golden times of architecture in Kuwait? Um, um, there was a point in time, yeah. maybe a prolonged period actually, where a lot of people from around the world were situated in Kuwait, yes. building Kuwait. Yeah. Um, I think it's very subjective. Each Mm. person has an era or a decade and they tend to be nostalgic to that. I try not to be, but I would say... Is it good for an architect to not be nostalgic? Yeah, which Mm. is hard, especially Mm. here. Um, But I think the 70s, there was this... uh, Because already the architecture was kind of semi-established. You had offices that were established Mm. in Kuwait in the 60s. So they learned from these foreign architects coming and working. Uh, so I think the 70s is where you start to notice a response to the climate, a response mm. to materiality that's happening here. Factories were built, so materials are being produced locally. So yeah, definitely 70s to 80s. I think that's, to me, not golden, but let's say my preferred era. Time, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And... Um... Um, was that time really better? Like we sometimes do get nostalgic, like you said. You would think that, but I I don't know. I don't want to be pessimistic, but (laughs) every research or every paper I read and uh, there, uh, there's quite a few, like there it's, yes, it was better. let's say, Mm. because uh, to the sense that there was this development, this forward trajectory of like wanting to develop better Mm. people's lives and all of that. But at the same time, things were already starting off, let's say, 80% good, and there's still 20 to 30% bad bureaucracy happening. And that's something that was there from, I was shocked to learn that it Mm. was there from the 50s, you know, and the 60s. And the way the city was rebuilt, completely destroyed and rebuilt, it wasn't correct. Let's mm. say so. We're still um, 
trying to rectify whatever was done because things were wiped mm. out completely disregarded and then someone made a plan and said this is what's going to work without really knowing how things work so Kuwait City as a city is still being you're still grappling with these mistakes that were made like what half a century ago I realize when I go to Kuwait City that even though there are a lot of houses or buildings that look like residential ones mm. it also feels like no one really lives there as if yeah. when you know the working hours are done that's it it's an empty yeah. it's an empty yeah. spot um is this deliberate or is this some sort of a, a link between how we see urbanization and architecture yeah i think it was deliberate because mm. it was planned as a financial district mm. right so when they Uh, did the land acquisition in the 50s and they moved everyone out of the city they mm. sold this idea of modernization you will live in a suburb you will have a house you'll have a car and then you drive to the city to work do your business and go back mm. um, so it was planned as a financial district not as a city um, and then the second master plan for Kuwait I think that happened in the 70s they wanted to fix that so they introduced residential areas that's when you got so upper for example. Mm. So they were trying to bring people back to the city because, as you mentioned, they mentioned mm. it's a ghost town after five. Yeah. Um, and I think now it is a bit better. Like there are a lot of businesses starting, restaurants, things like that. So the city is quite busy at mm. night, which is shocking. Yeah, it's not yeah, as, yeah. yes. It feels like even in the last 10 years as well. Yeah, it happened very which recently. Is, uh, yes, yeah. my period that I can follow. Um <laughs> We've mentioned in the beginning that you're an artist as well. Yes. Do these paths somehow, um, are they going from the beginning, you as an architect, you as an artist? Or is this something you found along the way? I think it's a bit of both. Do they complement yeah, each other? Yeah, kind of. Yes or and no. Uh, so like to re-establish what happened after university, I came back, took a year off uh, where I worked on my portfolio, architecturally speaking, and I was very deliberate in reaching out to offices. Mm. Uh, so I lucked out. I'm working on Bab Nim Nim Design Studio. I applied and I got, I started 2012, so it's almost 12 years now. Mm. And uh, I was very lucky. I think that I happened to be with good people. Mm. Our ideologies clicked with uh, everyone at the office, so I just stuck with it. And then over time, as I'm learning more as this, with the city, working, we worked on a couple of projects in the city, like Nukra, for example. Uh, so I got to understand more and more, like learn, relearning my history through work and through uh, just observing and working in Kuwait City. I used to just go walk around, take pictures, things like that. Um, and then... I would say, like, I started being an architect. Everything we do is on the screen. A lot of people have this image of an architect with, like, a paper and drawing and sketching. I don't know how to draw. I don't know how to sketch. I have the most horrible sketches that anyone could ever look at. Um, so starting off was an easy just to go to illustration. Mm -hmm. So I started illustrating buildings. Uh, any building that I found interesting, I would do d different illustrations from it. But it was still very much in the architectural realm. Um, and then in 2019, I was, again, that's when I met you and I was part of the SEDI in SEDU House uh, design and art program. Yeah. yeah. So that's when textile was reintroduced to me. Mm. Uh, it's something that I grew up with. My grandmother, my late grandmother, my mom, my aunts, they are all very passionate about textile. Uh, so I was kind of reintroduced to it. And that's, I think, something clicked there. And that's where I found my little niche to kind of hmm. do something in it. So since then, I kind of stuck with it, stuck with textile. Yeah. Are you, uh, you feel that you are reaching new, new layers, new levels, actually, of working with textile? Or you're still researching that, that first step in working with it? Yeah, I think there's so much in it. Mm. Like there is, I'm complete. Like sometimes I do say, okay, I'm a textile artist, but not mm. really. Like there's so there's weaving, there's you know pattern making, block printing, manipulation, quilting. There's so much in it that I just don't know. So I'm very much on the surface, but I try to 
related back to what I do, what Because I'm interested in. I did want in. to ask you about uh, Kuwait's famous past with uh, the heritage, the textile heritage yeah. connections to the countries. There was exchange of goods with sadhu weaving, which I'm sure you've tackled yes. in your work and being a resident artist. Yeah. Is this something that um, you're researching as well? Is is there something you can use from that past in your own work? Yeah, uh, no, there's so much. Mm. And again, Sedu House is a good resource. Like mm. their library is amazing. Uh, I used to go there and spend a, like a few hours whenever I could. Again, being a Kuwait city close to work, I can just, yeah. you know, leave and go after work. Um, there is so much in it. But at the same time, uh, I try not to what do you say, like appropriate whatever mm. was done. At the end yeah. of the day, it's a craft made by women. Mm. Uh, so being a man, I'm trying to be careful about how do you approach that and you don't want to appropriate whatever was done, even though we, at the end of the day, we're both Kuwaitis, you know, but yeah. there's so much history and so much uh, soul put into sadhu weaving that I try not to, you It know, just go and... In incredibly unique yeah very personal yes. like every weaver has her own story she's Emotions. creating her own mm. uh, she's making her own thread she's doing the whole thing from a to z you know so but what i what resonated with me is the fact that they're documenting their surroundings mm. so it's a way that they use textile to document their everyday life what they see i still remember the image of the plane that one of the Uh, weavers did so she's ah, yes. like I saw an airplane flying I documented it you know so I remember that. so that aspect is something that I'm comfortable with saying mm. is okay I'm using textile to document my surroundings yes yeah and back to you becoming an artist um, how did that go can you be an artist with just yourself working on your own things creating art do you have to search for channels to express it to showcase your work how does that look for you that creative journey i know you've been in a few residences yeah um was that something that has helped along the way yeah definitely and is I recognition think... important uh yes and no mm. of course you can't just be someone that's locked up in a space and mm. just constantly making art of, yeah, of course a, that's, that's amazing. a question whether that's uh, yeah, art or, <laughs> yeah you know, it's it, still good is it art if we don't see if you don't it, yeah. see it yeah mm. but at the same time you need these outputs you mm. know like with cultural institutions so i've done a few residencies starting with sedo mm. well actually before that i did one in al makan mm. uh, which is no longer there but i've done with them but that was illustrations and then sedo and then abdullah sam cultural center and after that i got the misc uh, grant yes. in saudi so that was like to me the the last okay i can say mm. i am an artist yes. you know that that was kind of like a badge of honor to justify that but because uh, there are a lot of architects that turn to art mm. i don't know if it's frustration with the practice it's it's i'm pretty sure it is because what you study is not what you practice to a certain extent yes. it depends i locked out again um but yeah there is uh, a need to have the work seen of course because at the end of the day i do have a day job uh, i'm not fully uh dedicated to mm. art making that would be ideal yes. but at the end of the day we need to live <laughs> you yes, know um so yeah but having these residencies or grants or whatever maybe gives you an incentive to create and produce so i think that helped out a mm. lot especially at the beginning to kind of work within deadlines even though i'm still being learning and relearning how to work with textiles i'm mm. teaching myself as i go along and Of course, uh, going back to my mom and aunts and kind of asking them how things were done. How do you work with this? How mm. do you... The learning about textile, there's so much. Constantly. Yeah. So it helped. I think it would be lovely if you tell us about the actual projects that you've done. Yeah. Your, or the art you have you have created. Yes. We speak in general terms, but it would be great to actually hear about them. What were you documenting and what were you creating, at least in these residences that you've mentioned or anything that you would yeah, like to share? Yeah, definitely. Like, again, being an architect uh, and a fan of the buildings in the 70s and 80s, those were the ones that kind of 
caught my attention. So, for example, in Abdullah Salim Cultural Center, I wanted to document three souks in Kuwait. So, mm. Souq Wataniya, Safat, and Manakh. Um, and they're all designed by the same architect, mm. uh, uh, TAC, which is an American company, and then locally working with PACE uh, as a local consultant. So they worked on the three projects. So I found them interesting. Mm -hmm. um, each one has a different story, has different history, interesting history. Uh, so I kind of worked on documenting these three and I did my research on those. And then uh, for the MISC grant, I wanted to kind of expand a bit more. Mm -hmm. So I looked at Blokkat, which is central business district number nine in Kuwait City, where is all of the textile markets, which is a natural progression, let's say. So Safat is in it. So I looked at that. And then I think during that grant is where it kind of clicked to me that like being an architect and having my education in architecture was all about the buildings and how to represent the buildings. But with art, it's not really that because why mm -hmm. not make a book and educate people about the architecture? You know, why doing art? So that's when my appreciation for my grandmother came mm. and like... Uh, remembering how she used to work with her sewing machine, with the textiles, with making these little mittens, we call them bays. Um, that image was always in my head of her working and sitting and working with these fabrics and textiles. So I wanted to bring that back. Uh, so that's how I worked with the Blokkat and kind of reinterpreting the district through these different mittens and archiving the district as a mass plan and uh, acquiring fabrics from these different buildings. And uh, yeah, and now this is what I'm continuing with, this kind of understanding mm. what makes Mishari, I hate saying that, but what makes me want to document yeah. and uh, preserve these buildings and at the same time, my family, like kind of... Uh, paying respect to the actual teachers, uh, to which are my mom, mm. my aunts, and my grandma. They're the ones that taught us yes. these things. Yeah. You mentioned you, you found your niche. Um, your work is very unique. Um, and um, you do it with a lot of grace. There's a lot of... One can see that there's a lot of patience put, yeah. put into it. Um, it's a slow, patient art. Uh, yes. And I'm enjoying it very much. Um, it feels like the fast-paced uh, uh, artwork or creation is not doing it for us anymore. Yeah. Somehow creating something new out of something that uh, for you carries a lot of heritage and a lot of memories, a lot of childhood moments, yeah. um, works. And it works for us as an audience as well. Um, are you comfortable in that niche? Mm. Yes and no. Mm. Uh, sometimes I think like I'm just repeating myself, mm. which is like a bad state of mind to be in. But yeah. it's um, very common, though. Yeah. Yeah, mm. it is. You know, and I feel like if you just if you don't worry or question yourself as you're working, then there is no point in producing. Uh, but yeah, I do enjoy it. As you mentioned, it is a much slower, mm. uh, deliberate, you know, approach textile like you have to be relatively patient with it and it's something by hand like I always want to learn like I got a sewing machine and I taught mm. myself how to use it like I wanted to uh, do it a lot of people be like okay why don't you just give it to a tailor mm. and have them do it and you just give them the idea but then I'm like that's just architecture isn't it <laughs> you draw the plan <laughs> and you get you yeah. hire a contractor Someone and they else, build yeah. it for you so I wanted this handmade uh, deliberate, like it's not perfect. Uh, I try because again, with architecture and design, you have to be very detail oriented, mm. you know, and especially with us, like in Bob Nimnim, it's all about the details, which mm. I love. But at the same time, when I'm working with textile, I want to kind of let loose and I'm fine with things not being perfect. Uh, I don't even hem fabric, which is such a big no, no, <laughs> when it comes no. to textile, because mm. eventually the thread is yeah, just yeah. gonna, but I intentionally do that because I want to oppose this idea of permanent structures. Mm. So I want something temporal, something that could potentially with time just not be there anymore. Mm. Yeah. I have a few threads from some of your works. 
Yeah. <laughs> if you remember, I think you deliberately left them loose yes. uh, in your study yes. uh, residency. Yeah. And my children actually took them with yeah. notes. Yes. So we keep them. Yeah. When you're famous, <laughs> we'll exhibit you can sell them. them. <laughs> no, no, we're not getting rid of them. I am, in a way, a, a, a collector of these small items from different exhibitions. So this, yeah. this is, uh, this is like a little treasure for me. Um, but you've, um, you've inspired me in something. I've been going around the world searching for these textile museums mm. that wouldn't normally interest me. I think Sadhu did that for me as well, yeah. because I come from a heritage with weaving, but I was never really interested before right. learning about Sadhu and the uniqueness of uh, Bedouin weaving. And um, recent, not recently, but a few years ago, I was in, in France, in mm. Milouze, and they were an, an important spot in uh, with textile caravans and a textile industry and very large prints so to speak the yeah. wooden ones created which are really huge in the museum mm. and their entrance ticket is a piece of cloth yeah i textile. remember yes, yeah, you mentioned yeah so them, yeah. these things I, I don't think i would have done that without your uh, okay <laughs> being inspired by the work you do yeah yeah um you have mentioned that um you document for certain reasons and um, um i also want to go back a little bit to your um to your uh, uh, part of your personality that's an architect mm. there's a lot of buildings being demolished uh, in everywhere in the world yeah um, but somehow modernity feels like we have we we deal with this with with buildings being demolished sometimes for no apparent reason yeah sometimes even though the uh, the architects are opposing it or the public is opposing it mm -hmm. so um, do we heal our relationship with buildings by documenting them, not knowing what happens next? Or are you fine with them? You did mention, actually, fine with them kind of disappearing like you leave your threads unfinished, yeah, yeah. your textiles unfinished. Yeah, um, yeah, because I think the thing, the issue with, with Kuwait, because it's such a young country, mm. um, and as I mentioned, it was completely eradicated and rebuilt. So there mm. is this notion that anything, that, anything that's not mud, Mm. is not worth preserving um and i in the very like coming back in the very beginning there were a lot of buildings that were being demolished and i was very much opposing that but i don't know now if it's just me getting used to it or like some mm. buildings i'd be like okay you know what yeah this could go yeah not every modernist building should be preserved like there has to be some sort of historical context to it, uh, significance. Uh, sadly, that's the case. And maintenance mm -hmm. is a huge issue with Kuwait. Like you do build a building and then you just let it be because it's generating income. Yeah. So you just let it deteriorate over time. Uh, so eventually there is no point in preserving and it doesn't make any financial sense to preserve yeah. and renovate it's so much easier to demolish especially that there isn't much land in Kuwait city documenting is mm. important you have to document educate people who are willing to be educated you can't just assume everyone's gonna see eye to eye with yeah. your ideology but uh, preserving documentation is important to showcase that there is beauty in these buildings that you deem ugly Mm. You know, so to me, that's important. And your studio is in an important building. Yes. How did that come to be? Why Why that <laughs> building? I'm leaving it to you to say which one it is. Yeah. So, and why? Yeah. So I've recently, well, not recently, almost a year ago, moved to Studio Khimiai in uh, Sugul Wataniya, in Kuwait mm -hmm. City. And it just happens to be one of my favorite buildings in Kuwait. Um, you lucked out again. I lucked out. I, I <laughs> seem to be very lucky. <laughs> now we are realizing yeah. that we're establishing that. <laughs> but yeah. it just happened. To start off, uh, I was in Safat Studios, which was touched by Siri Agoub. She did this kind of incubator space where she a took... A lot of artists are there. A lot yeah. of artists mm -hmm. are there. She took a floor in an office building in Kuwait, renovated into artist studios. So I was on the waiting list mm -hmm. for that. And uh, every time a seal reaches out to me, which I'm very, very thankful, mm -hmm. uh, she reaches out. She's like, oh, there's a new space available. I see it or like, it just doesn't work. Um, so eventually, 
Huda uh, Abdelmukhni, who's uh, the founder of Khamiai, texts me and she's like, hi, I got your number from Asil. I'm looking mm. for someone uh, to rent with me there because uh, Tala, who's a textile artist, mm. Mm. Uh, she, she works with natural dyes, is moving out. So she wanted to find someone else to move in. And I was like, yes, please. Next day I went, saw the space, beautiful space. And yeah, I just now um, happen to have my art studio in one of my favorite buildings in Kuwait. Yeah. That sounds amazing. Yeah. Does work uh, look different once you're in, in your studio, outside your usual spaces? Yeah, because... Do you feel like in a way, uh, tempted to work more? Yeah. Does it keep you disciplined? Of course, of course. First thing first, you're paying rent, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So you have to justify mm. this expense. I'm very thankful that I can mm. afford doing that. Not a lot of people can. I'm very aware of that. It's an it's an added luxury. Yeah. Not anyone can afford having a studio space, especially in Kuwait. There aren't much Mm. spaces that offer that so that alone it's enough incentive to be you no know, get up go uh, it's being very close to work is also mm. good so i leave work i can go there uh, it's like a five minute drive i can walk there if the weather permits so which is good and yeah just having this third space to kind of detach my mind okay i'm not the architect now mm. I'm not the the son or you know yes your usual home. roles yeah. yeah so this is a new added space that I get to kind of detach uh, we have to juggle a lot of roles yes <laughs> sometimes they kill the artist they do but yeah it's just allowing yourself giving mm. yourself the time and the space like the moment I'm in that space it's like okay I can switch off or change the hat, let's say, and halas. now it's like, think of art <laughs> and make something. Yeah. Uh, do you get to document the building as well? I've seen some posts on social yes, media yes, that you've yes. made. Uh, I'm actually, I worked on a piece that documents the changes that the mm. building happened, uh, went through. Um, ironically, the day I move in, uh, I'm moving in my stuff, I see construction happening in mm. the building. And I asked Huda, I was like, Huda, what's happening? And she's like, yeah, they're renovating it because it's um, there's a BOT system. So it's called mm -hmm. Build, Operate, Transfer. So this was something that was established by the government to incentivize uh, private investors to develop in the city. So they give them a plot of land. They tell them, build it, operate it for a certain number of years. And then eventually you have to transfer ownership back to the government. Uh, so when I moved in, that was the time where their transfer was supposed to happen. But a thing, I don't know if you noticed, like a five or ten years ago, a lot of different souks in Kuwait City, like the one next to Mbarke, the big white one, mm -hmm. Super Kuwait, they were all renovated. Not nicely, but they were renovated. So that's when their time was up. So if you renovate it and prove that you're taking care of the building, you can extend your lease. Mm. So that happened and uh, it was a haphazard renovation, <laughs> but I was lucked out because I'm right there. I can see it happening. So I documented that and I have a piece that will be showcased next month in a group exhibition that tackles that BOT and uh, renovation mm. process that happened. So. It just worked out. They might be like, oh my God, Shari, just move on. Like, think of, look at different buildings, but I can't. I'm right there, you know. Yes, yeah. no, no, it makes sense. It would be lovely to see that. Um, yeah. Now that you've mentioned that, um, I realize that you are very present in other people's exhibitions and yeah. uh, you're very supportive to other artists' work. Yeah. Which is magnificent, really. Um, how much inspiration it brings you? Um, do you share knowledge? Do you learn from others? How is that scene, artistic scene in Kuwait? How do you find it? I think it's good. Uh, a lot of people say there isn't anything happening, but... No, no, yeah, that's not true. No, we know there that. Isn't. Yeah. And like I have... Uh, We're here actually, even with this podcast, <laughs> yeah. to, to rectify that, that yeah. notion. Yeah. <laughs> no, there is so much happening. And uh, I have friends in Bahrain. Mm. Um, so one of them is an artist friend. She's also a textile artist. Mm. Uh, and she tells me like, every day you're going to some sort of opening. Like how much is happening in Kuwait? Because Bahrain... 
is not as much, you know, like you get mm. two, three, four openings a year and you're like almost every week you're going. And I was like, yeah, there is. It's very reassuring, yeah. to be honest. When, and you have yeah. to seek it out. That's the only mm. thing. And I remember uh, speaking of that, there there is a lot of discourse between artists. Like they mm. have these gatherings and things like that. Uh, Gallery Bawa, for example, used to do these hangouts in their space where they bring different artists or designers and they just talk, you know. Uh, so I did mention that any exhibition is a good exhibition mm. because at, as far as the artist had the guts to put up the work and say, come look at it and judge me, to me it's a win, no matter whatever is up on the wall. Uh, so that alone is inspiration. The fact that I see people putting the time and effort and exposing mm. themselves, you know, because that's it's takes very, a lot of guts. Vulnerable. Yeah. Yes. So to me, that alone is a good, like, you know, fire to be like, okay, maybe I should be next. Uh, my work should be up there. So yeah. it's a good incentive to just go out and see. And you meet lovely people. Yes. Yeah. I think uh, we as a cultural center, we always know we can count on you. You, Mishari will show <laughs> up, which is amazing yeah. because we get feedback Um your colleagues get appreciation and support, and that's just uh, immeasurable in how, yeah. how worthy it is. Um, I wanted to ask you, in your opinion, uh, presence of Kuwait artists in uh, internationally, regionally and internationally. Mm. Not enough, obviously. Yeah. Um, is this something that needs to be supported from various sides? Uh, it's always a question of government. Um, there needs to be a plan and a cultural policy behind yeah. it, of course. But um, because we we see examples of uh, regional work being presented here, we mm -hmm. know of the examples of different artists coming and creating art here. Yeah. And even though I'm, I was, I would never be one of those people saying, "Oh, we have to do only with what we have here," yeah. because exchange and diversity is crucial for art growth. But should Kuwait be present more? Yeah, definitely. And mm. I think there needs to be this exchange, right? Mm. Where you invite artists, Do but at the same time... Do these platforms exist? Or are they based on, you know, personal contacts? And, I think uh, so. Like, mm. there isn't really this institution that's doing that. It would be Kuwait. great to yeah. have, like, a mobility art of artists. Council. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. God, it's like, good luck, you know, yes, for, yes, yeah. uh, meeting eye to eye. But... Yeah, there isn't this, inst or there are, but they're not doing what they should be doing. It's like, mm -hmm. uh, for like as I mentioned, as Will Safat Studios, that's a personal effort, yeah, and it yeah. shouldn't be mm -hmm. a personal effort to create such spaces. You know, uh, there is, and there are quite a few artists that are showcasing regionally, internationally, Kuwaiti artists, and it has been the case for years. Like. Uh, but there isn't this exposure or knowledge, you know, like mm. why are why aren't we learning about these artists at school? You know, like yes. uh, uh, these pioneers, you know, that I learned about coming back and after, you know, why aren't they being showcased? And mm. I don't know. I understand. It's a, um, it's a, it needs to be a cumulative effort. Yeah, actually. it's a lot of work. <laughs> and part of a curriculum. Um, there is, um, there's part of you that's also an educator. It's a very uh, natural part of, of an art, of being an artist. Yeah. How did that come to be? I would like us to discuss uh, the e-narrative platform. Yes. Um, so that came about in 2017. Mm. So I just did my residency in Al Makan. Mm. Uh, and I did my first solo there. And then after, uh, as I mentioned, I have a few friends in Bahrain, one of them being Sarah Abdullah, who we co-founded the narrative together. I saw her Whom posting. We're sending regards yes, to because we know her. Yes, in a mountain. <laughs> she is a very active woman. Yeah, yes. unlike me. Uh, <laughs> but she was posting about this initiative that she worked on with mm. the cultural uh, ministry in Bahrain, and they were giving a workshop with a Kuwaiti architect. Mm. So I saw it, and I'm like, "Oh, Sara, why don't we do something? Why don't I just give a workshop with you?" and we decided to do it and we just started a workshop. We did it ourselves and uh, that was in 2017 in Bahrain. Uh, so we started a narrative almost at a moment of frustration um, mm. with architecture. Best things are yeah. created in frustration. <laughs> yeah, mm. and it always starts with a phone call. Like mm. we always have this thing that me and Sarah say free for a call since again, she's not in Kuwait. So it started with a conversation, me and her, and we wanted to create this platform that 
broadens the outreach of architecture. We didn't want, we felt like architecture is very self-referential and self-evolved. Architects only kind of care to speak to other architects, even though their work is the most out there and exposed, you know, you have to deal with people occupying the spaces Mm. that you do. And we don't have that understanding or like we kind of have this ownership. No, I must be the know-it-all and control everything that I do. So it came out of that. We wanted to create something much more approachable, humble, experiential. So we started a narrative as a platform where we encourage observation in the cities that we live in. We encourage storytelling, hence the narrative aspect of it. And yeah, we just do different workshops, uh, different uh, like we research, artwork, whatever it may be. Just uh, we welcome it as it comes to us. We don't go and actively seek out, not anymore. We used to in the beginning. Mm. But I feel like now, a few years later, like I feel like, okay, we know what we do. And then thankfully people like Promenade reach out to us and we we offer our service. It came very naturally yeah. to us. I think we knew of your work and um, I used to live in Havali where we are right now situated yes. in this um, today. And um, I realized that there are a lot of buildings that are worthy of of mentioning and that they are somehow now scattered in this mm. really a concrete jungle. Yeah. Didn't know much about the heritage of Hawaii right. and how it was a city in a city in a way. So um, creating this cultural map, mm-hmm. which we're, it's a continuous process for yes, us because going. we've covered uh, certain buildings um, and we've, we've done a few, a few workshops and um, um, may we maybe briefly discuss your ideas for our future workshops that we did say we will do. Yeah. Um, you don't necessarily have to mention the buildings yeah. themselves if you don't want to, but I am interested to, um, we are interested to hear on how much more is there in Hawali, for instance, or even in Kuwait in general. Yeah. No, there is so much. Mm. Um, sadly, uh, I hate to say this, but <laughs> there was a word, my, I think it was my grandmother that used to say, she used to say, Hawali Khalaywadi. So Iwelli is something that you disregard mm. or not think about. Mm. So there was this notion that Hawali is just this leftover huge city and that has so much history, but it was just disregarded. You know, mm-hmm. there was like, Forgotten. it's a backdrop. Your destination is either Kuwait City, Salmiya, maybe mm. in the 90s. But uh, Hawali was this awkward space in between and... Uh, even though there's so much history, like mm. you mentioned, so um, when we wanted, when we did the first workshop with you, Hawali Bound, we wanted to create a map of the city, but in a sense, with what's important to participants. Uh, so they kind of dictated what goes on that map. So it's an interesting way to look at a city, rather than being very technical about mm. mapping out a city, is rather much more of what do you experience. What do you remember? And from that, we realized a lot of us grew up going and coming to Hawali. And there was Mujama Rehab, for example, is, oh my God, like every aid we used to go and buy video games from there. So like that was a huge important destination. Uh, Jarir, mm. Lajeri bookstore, uh, Mujama Negra. The, so the uh, cinema and Dedos, which is no longer there, but there was so much that it was a destination and it is the cultural output of Kuwait. Mm. So you have Studio at Nadair, all of these studios and music st- uh, stores and that is as a theater. So there was this output that was happening, but sadly now it's kind of forgotten or mm. it's there, but no one really looks at it. So yeah, we do this. We revive them in a way, at in least in way. memories yeah. and, and our workshops. I think what's what's great, but not easy to explain to audiences, is that this these workshops are for everyone. Yes, you don't have to have any previous knowledge of architecture. You don't have to be skillful with your hands because no. we do block printing. Yeah. I think it's uh, great to mention that the participants create. They work on joint projects. Mm-hmm. They create these large tapestries. Yeah. Um, We've exhibited the one from our first workshop. We might be compiling that work for a future exhibition, yeah. why not? Uh, but that people actually are joined together in how they perceive uh, Havali. Recently, my colleague Farah and I, we went to 
um, an event where we've uh, shown some of the Havali zines mm. that you and Sarah have created yeah. for the first workshop, where you can, in a way, reimagine Havali using right. stickers. And, and it just created so much interest with, with youngsters. Yeah. So is it the way of how you approach participants? You never know what kind of group you're you getting. You never know, yeah. Um, is this a way of introducing architecture and urbanism and heritage to audiences through this yeah it's through just, igniting their knowledge yeah, and experience i think that's what's very tough in kind of communicating that mm. because you can never communicate that in a post yeah. <laughs> you know but even though the posts are beautiful but yeah i think this is where your catchy yeah. titles yeah come handy. we try we try yeah. like so, uh, kudos to sarah that she's the one <laughs> she's like the wizard with words from not what me. i understand great in both english and Arabic. yeah yeah we try to keep them like Whimsical, let's yes. say, uh, mm. kind of attention grabbing. Sometimes it helps that the building does the talking for us. Mm. So, Athman Center, a workshop that I gave, we gave yes. last year and last, last December, year, yes. the building did all the work. Mm. <laughs> you know, like it's a fabulous building, very kitschy. It did mm. the work for us. Uh, sometimes you have to be smarter about it. But yeah, it's very much experiment experiential. We. Even when we start a workshop, we make it a point saying that neither me or Sarah are experts on on whatever we're showing. We are learning with you as much mm. as you are learning from us. Like it's this exchange uh, that we work collectively. We revisit things collectively, mm. be it memories, buildings, whatever it may be. So, and we use block printing as a way to kind of facilitate that. It's mm. block printing is very easy, more or less. Um, but interestingly, I don't think anyone has tried it before of all of our participants. Yeah, which is, which is it's great, funny. Yes. Like, I don't know. But I remember like we've given a workshop in Sharjah uh, back in March. And then we started off saying, do you does anyone know any block printing? And no one said anything. And then when the workshop ended to ladies came up and we're like by the way we've we've been doing it for years and then she showed me her work and i was like oh my god you should be teaching <laughs> why am i sh like showing you how to carve a block you know but yeah a lot of people don't because i feel at the, a certain age you just lose this connection with making things mm. with your hand right and as adults we try to be very pragmatic about things mm. and very controlling which is I feel working with textile printing, block printing, paint, you get your hands dirty. Mm. It kind of like... You're proud of your work, of the outcome of your work. Yeah, in the yeah. End, yeah. And it's something that you made. You and know? if we need anything in the world, it's more people working with hands and crafts. Yeah, exactly. Yes. And yeah, yeah. less doctors and engineers, which is, by the way, where my, my family is. Yeah, <laughs> even mine. And we still need yes. them. <laughs> I don't want to die, but... No, you like... know what they say. We need them, but we... We don't live for that. We live for poetry yeah, and uh, of things we create with the yeah, hands yeah, and art yeah. and so on. And it has yeah. to be. Like, I think that's what makes it unique mm. or special. And every workshop is completely different. Even though the approach is relatively the same, but I think the participants bring so much Everyone, yeah, into it. And new. me and Sara, every, every, especially the, after the first day or the first hour of the workshop, we always be like, oh my God, like, this is completely different. We'd never imagined it to be like that. And we always have this preconceived notion of what the outcome would be. Mm. And I remember starting off, I used to get very frustrated of, mm. of thinking, why isn't, why aren't they getting it? Or why isn't it happening the way I envisioned it? But then eventually I learned that that's not the point. You should yeah. never go into a workshop as an instructor expect, expecting a certain outcome because it will never be. And I think that what makes it interesting and beautiful. And it's something that's just a shared experience for a day or two. Uh, for example, in the first workshop, no, it was like almost a month. Yes, um, we had three weeks yeah. of, of weekend. Uh, and it's workshops. just like, it's you get to learn, know these people, even though it's quick. But I feel like there's always a nice takeaway from it. Yeah. yeah. Well, we're looking into continuing for sure and um, yes. uncovering new buildings with you. Yeah. Our time is passing very quickly. Yeah. I wanted to ask <laughs> you, um, uh, we're not a tourist guide here or anything, <laughs> but it's so great to hear from people who are involved with a topic and in, in this area. What buildings should we see? What we shouldn't miss? We mentioned a lot. Yeah. I recently had a cousin who is an art historian who came to Kuwait. And she said, I tried, I googled. 
everything um, I see uh, seems to be uh, online, seems to be related to malls. Right. Which, of course, we know it's not true. Mm. But so we need to work more, obviously, on on presenting these uh, these lands, these sites, these buildings. Yeah. What would you recommend? God, there's so many. Um, Even for us as locals. Yeah. Uh, well, I would say Watani, but that would yeah. be such a cliche. Uh, so I won't. But I will pick a sister to Sug mm. Watani. I would say Sug mm. Uh It's not an interesting building per se. Not as much as Watani or Tsafat. But I think just looking into the history of the Sug itself and what happened in Sug Manach. Uh, I'm not going to get into it because w- we will <laughs> talk for yet another hour. But just learning that buildings can have so much impact in history. And it was, uh, the let's say, the stage for an economic crisis, you mm. know. But it's just, I'm sure whoever designed it did not think okay. that will happen in it. But I feel like every time going to that building, especially knowing the history, I feel like it's so charged as a mm. space and there's so much, I don't know, <laughs> it's not haunted, but like there is something to it that I feel is not can't, is not replicated and you mm. can't find that easily. Very interesting. Yeah, so I would recommend first looking up Menach mm. Crisis, learning about it and then going to the building. Yeah. And what's in works for you as an artist? Yeah, as I mentioned, there is a collective exhibit happening next Mm -hmm. month. And I'm also working towards a solo, hopefully. I know I've been saying that for years, (laughs) but this time I'm taking it a bit more seriously. I've met two curators, lovely curators. I'm working with them just starting off. Uh, But it will be a bit more of what I talked about. So about the architecture, the buildings that mm. I find interesting, and also about my family history mm. and trying to document You're that. Into yeah, that. Mm. because I feel like it's about time I honor the women in my family, especially that my maternal side of the family, the bloodline stopped mm. in that. So I feel like I have to kind of work on mm. showcasing. So hopefully, no pressure, but <laughs> something will come out. We're yeah. looking forward to it. Yeah. Mishari, thank you so much for the time you thank dedicated you. to us today. Thank and so we much. hope to see you soon back at Culture Corner as well as in Promenade Culture Center. Yeah, definitely. And thank you for having me. It was lovely. And we always say with whenever we're working with Promenade, we're in good hands. Very happy to hear yeah. that. <laughs> we'll see you soon. Yes, thank, thank you. you.